Joy, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to have you on. It is great to be on. Jimmy, it's so fun being on the show. I'm so excited. I apologize for being in my closet. Um, <laughs> but we're having some work done in the house this week. And I, I love wanted it. to make sure it was quiet. So it's the quietest place in the house. So I'm, I'm in my closet. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. Any fan of shoes, people are like, this is like, they're geeking out right now. They were so jealous of your collection. Uh, I, I have so many things oh. I want to talk to you about. Uh, for, uh, congrats on the readout, by the way. It just launched in July, and it's doing fantastic, crushing in the ratings. I was looking at some information about you, and you're the first woman of color to anchor a primetime news show on MSNBC, and you're also the only black woman currently anchoring a primetime news show of, on any of the major networks. That is, yeah. uh, what an accomplishment. Uh, wh yeah. what, does that, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it's, it's daunting, right? I mean, it, 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 and when, when it kind of sunk in that I was going to be doing this. It, it felt really big. You know, I grew up, you know, being a news junkie from sixth grade on. And, you know, everyone that was sort of telling me the world and telling me about the news, the Ted Koppels of the world, the Dan Rathers, all the people that I admired, it was all white guys, yeah. right? There was really, there were very few people like me that I could really see on TV. So when I finally saw Gwen Eiffel, it was like, oh, you know, I, I just revered her because it was so exciting. Carol Simpson and Gwen Eiffel were the only black women that I can remember growing up, Connie yeah. Chung, the only other woman of color. So the very few women of color that I've seen in this space, I've always gravitated toward them. I, I finally did get a chance to meet Gwen Eiffel before she passed. I was so excited. I ran across the street in Selma, Alabama and threw myself on top of her to give wow. her a hug. She was very nice about it and let me take a selfie with her, which I treasure. So yeah, it's big because for some little kid, you know, some little black girl, I'm like, that to them in a way like they're maybe seeing me and feeling like okay i can do this this is something yeah, that could that's I exactly can do. right i can yeah. do that i can i can be that yeah we should talk about some of the news that's happening uh uh obviously today is the uh 19th anniversary of uh september 11th attacks yeah. um w were you working in news then what do you remember about that day I was. I mean, by then we had three young kids, but I, we were living in Florida and I was now working for the NBC affiliate, uh, WTVJ in Miami. And I remember it was my day off, actually. 9-11, I was, in, I was in, having an off day. And my brother had come up from Denver and was staying with us. And I remember him yelling, oh, S word. Um, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. And at first I thought maybe it was just the wrong way plane, because we had actually had a story like that not long before that in Miami where a guy just went off track and hit a building. So I'm thinking this is just the wrong way plane. By the time I walked down the stairs, the second plane hit. And that's when we all realized this is not a wrong way plane. This is serious. Phone went off. I had to go into work. Um, it was shocking. I think I was so stunned for the first probably, you know, six or seven hours that it didn't hit me. But when it did, I will admit, I'm not ashamed to admit, I, I just cried. And I don't cry at work. I try not to ever cry at work, you know, no matter how tough the story. But I cried that day. And then the day that, um, I, I don't know if you remember, the Boys Choir of Harlem did a thing um, where they went into Yankee Stadium and they sang, we shall overcome to try to cheer New York up. Oh. And I just, I lost it. Like, Gosh. you know, yeah. And then to, to see the city come back and also uh, is pretty inspiring as well. And to see yeah. the first responders and everyone oh helping, doing whatever they can to help each other. And I was like, oof. New York is still the greatest city uh, in the world. It oh. just is. It's the most resilient. It's the, you know, people like New Yorkers aren't friendly. No, New Yorkers will give you the shirt off their back. They will do anything for you. New York comes together like no other city and rebounds like no other city, even with what's happening now. I agree. I was just in New York recently. New York is fighting its way back. Nothing can stop New York. Uh, uh, what else is happening in the news? Uh, I guess everyone's still talking about Bob Woodward's book uh, and the tapes. Ah. I just don't quite understand it. What are your takes? Because so basically the president admitted that he downplayed the threats of yeah. coronavirus. Uh, he just said a lot of stuff, but what was, he, what was he thinking? Why would he do that? And, and here's the thing, Jimmy. It's not, it, it's not even as if Bob Woodward called the White House switchboard and said, let me talk to Trump. Let me talk to him just for five minutes. No, Trump called him on one of the critical phone calls where he admitted that he was just downplaying it, even though he knew that this was a deadly virus that, oh, is airborne. Not only that, the day that he called Bob Woodward and gave him that on the record interview where he's like, I'm playing it down. I like to play it down. He held a rally that day. I mean, he literally in the contemporaneous period and then kept holding rallies 
and then stopped for a while and then went right back and did it in Tulsa the day after Juneteenth. This man has known the whole time. You know, I did a commentary on the show the other day where I said, look, at the end of the day, Donald Trump has lost his credibility with people like me, people who cover him day in and day out and who have, have you know, I've written a book about him. I've interviewed all of his biographers nearly, people who've worked with him, people who've worked on The Apprentice. Very difficult for me to take him at face value when he talks. But his supporters do. They believe everything he says. It's them he's primarily lying to. It's them who he's convinced not to wear masks. It's them who will take his advice and try bleach and thinking that that will help them. It's them. Oh, and, and then they put the rest of us in danger because they won't protect themselves. Uh, I'm sure you saw the rally last night with everyone with... It was Unbelievable. Just... And they played Fortunate Son as like the intro song. It's just so... It's bizarre. I, 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 I want to talk about uh, a big project with Peacock and MSNBC tomorrow night at 10. But uh, yeah. it's a documentary called The Sit-In. I'm hosting The Tonight Show, so I know this story. But a lot of people might not know this uh, story. Do you want to explain what The Sit-In is about? Yeah, and Jimmy, I didn't know it either. Like, I did not know that. And, you know, we talked early on about the idea of, you know, me hosting, um, you know, a, a primetime news show. You, as you know, late night is very similar in terms of the demographics of the people who've dominated late night, you know, since the 1950s. You know, Johnny Carson, of course, being the guy who made late night into late night, created this, this incredible platform that you, you know, are blessed to continue and that we're thankful that you're continuing. So, but you also know that the platform has generally been about a breath, right? It's, it's like Walter Cronkite at six and then a deep breath for yeah. late night where you can just chill, Yeah. right? And that's what it was. But Johnny had an ethos. Johnny, he was a little, you know, he was a little bit of a social gangster a little bit. He was like, I'm a little gangster with this. I'm gonna do something big. He took this platform and he gave it to the first black man to ever host in late night. And that black man is Harry Belafonte. February, 1968, middle heart of the civil rights movement. You know, violence and riots had been going on over police killings and abuse of black people. It was a really difficult time in America. He, get, you know, Johnny Carson hands this week over to Harry Belafonte and he says, do whatever you want with it. And Harry says, you know what I'm gonna do with it? I'm gonna go big. Yes, I'm gonna have on Aretha Franklin, Buffy St. Marie, like great entertainers, but I'm also gonna have on my political friends political people, and he had on the two biggest in terms of social gospel, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, and Robert F. Kennedy. And he does the last the interviews, especially with Dr. King. I think this was his last recorded interview. It is, uh, it's a great documentary. It's called The Sit-In. It's on Peacock currently and tomorrow night on MSNBC. I want to show yes. a clip. Here's a clip from The Sit-In. Check it out. Well, I'm delighted to be here, Harry. And I'll tell you one of the reasons I'm so happy to be here I flew out of Washington this afternoon, and as soon as we started out, they notified us that the plane had mechanical difficulties, and I don't want to give you an impression that as a Baptist preacher, I don't have faith in God in the air. It's simply that I've had more experience with him on the ground. I was kind of amused that he knew how to get laughter, which is something that you don't see in his speeches because he's so serious. My thing was like, oh, he could tell a good joke. Fantastic, Joy Reid, everybody. I also want to mention The Man Who Sold America, your best-selling book is now paperback with brand new chapters. Go check that out. Uh, also, uh, please watch The Sit-In on Peacock Now. We'll be right back with a performance from The Flaming Lips. Thank you again, Joy, for being here. Thank you, Jimmy, for having me. Bye-bye. On and on and on. Uh, I said, and it's on.